I remember a lot of those conversations, you know, but it's different when, when it's men, you know, it's, it, we, we've been, we've been programmed, programmed, right? programmed to, we've been programmed yeah. to, to not bring this home. You can't cry. You can't. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the suffering podcast. 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 We would have a special camera. It was the Chris's <laughs> facial expression camera. And they would just set it up there and it would record all it would they would put it on my face and they would record everything that I did. And then they would cut it in and edit it in when, you know, they to, to give it some context. How how is Detective Anderson's feeling? Well, look at his face. He says that's bullshit. <laughs> so so yeah, but uh for for first forty eight they didn't do it as much, but for reasonable doubt, definitely. And you know, and I, I know a lot of the people that watch R D they could tell it. I, I don't have a poker face. And when, I, when when I was working for the uh, the sheriff's department, we were doing the what they call the dirty daddy raids. You know, oh yeah, child yeah, yeah. support raids. Oh you know? no, no, no. They, this isn't about the football player. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to get into that. No, please don't. But they they had all these dirty daddy raids, and we had a brand new sheriff, and he was trying to make a big name for himself. He gets the local TV crew to come follow us and everything. We're going to the houses, locking people up. We bring him back to the jail and we're standing outside and the sheriff is actually giving an interview and he, he comes up and he goes, Mike, I want you to stand behind me, you know, for the interview. I'm like, I don't know. I was chewing tobacco back then, so I had a big <laughs> dip in my lip and I'm just, at a, uh, all of a sudden the cameras turned to me and they asked me a question. I had to swallow a whole <laughs> oh. mouthful, mouthful of fucking chewing tobacco spit. Got got through the got through the interview. Went up and like threw up between the fuck. <laughs> when you were when you were working those homicides, when you were working those tough cases, mm-hmm. was humor ever some something that you guys threw in? Not in front of the victim, Absolutely family, never. not. But just to sort of ease the tension, because people don't realize that that's how we ease tension. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, especially the crew at First Forty Eight, they had gotten so jaded, uh, you know. By being, you know, going with us and being on these crime scenes, you know, look. So there is a, uh, we we always threw in humor, yeah, always. But it got to the point where they started throwing in humor. I remember one night, uh, myself and my partner Jerry Williams, we were both, uh, we had been out. It, it we were going into our thirty six hours, thirty sixth hour of being out working the homicide. I mean, we just kept getting. And you only got out. twelve more, and then the show's over, <laughs> right? I know, right? <laughs> so we had been into our thirty sixth hour, and then we got a hot case where a, a young lady had been murdered, and her uh, we couldn't find her son. So we were back rolling again. We got back to the office and sat down, and. I was just we were just having our 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 talk through of what we needed to do the following day. We were about to get ready to go home. We were going through our talk through. They had brought me a coke to help you know help hopefully the caffeine to get me going again. And by the time we started off and and started taking notes, both of us had passed out. <laughs> we sitting up there just just knocked out, and they are just snapping picture after picture after picture of both of us knocked out at our desk, and then they posted it on on social media. You know, the homicide detectives at yeah. hard at work, working real hard, working yeah. real hard, and we just knocked out. So, so yeah, I thought it was funny. It was hilarious to me, you know. But you know, my course, my chief of police didn't think it was funny. At all. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, but that's how we get through these things. You do humor gets you through it. You do. If, if you don't laugh at it, I mean, mm-hmm. we talk about it all the time, and. And like I said, that that's what this podcast is all about. I'm the one that makes the stupid jokes when shit gets deep, you know? Right, right, right. Because it, life gets deep at sometimes. If you mm-hmm. don't laugh, even if laughing at yourself, I'm not saying it's right to laugh at a victim of a crime. But you're not. But we're not. We're you're laughing not. about. It's a release. Yeah. Right. A, a situation. Mm-hmm. Not Absolutely. at a person. You mm-hmm. know, you, you're seeing people at their worst. And regardless of what everybody thinks, there's nobody that dies stoically famous last word like john yeah. wayne on tv like mm-hmm. oh it's been a good life no yeah. it's usually yeah. yelling screaming crying shit mm-hmm. and pissing their pants yeah yeah on the toilet on mm-hmm. the toilet yeah and and <laughs> you're seeing that yeah. the the inhumanity that they're experiencing right now because mm-hmm. you do lose all sorts of humanity you do there was a, a young social worker i've told this story before but there was a young social worker that was a friend of my wife's and she's like no we can she we can have people die with dignity. I'm like, I'm telling you, there's really no dignity in the life. Very small percentage ever get that luxury. 
And three, four years go by, and she moves away. But she came back, and she's visiting with us. And she goes, she looks at me and goes, you know what? You're right. Yeah. So he's damn right. Yeah. I've you know. seen a lot of dead people, and they've never been like this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah right. never been smi- I don't think I've ever seen a dead person smile. I've seen a lot of, a lot of naked old people. Yeah. All right. I've seen people just at their worst moments crying, mm-hmm. screaming, yelling for whatever God they worship. Yeah. Even if they don't worship, they're trying to yell for somebody. Mm-hmm. It, it's a it's a rotten situation. And I mean, when, when you see someone take their last breath, oh yeah, how do you shut that off? You you can't. You don't. Yeah. You, you can't. You gotta. You either gotta, like you said, fall into the bottle or mm-hmm. joke about it, laugh about it, do something. What finally got you through, though? What finally got you through to open yourself up? Because um, it doesn't seem like you still have that ton of bricks on your back. I don't, man. I, I don't. I, and I, I don't. It, it took me. It took me years to to, to figure it out. And that, and that was really it. Detaching myself away from the the human side, especially on the crime scenes, I had to. I mean, I, I couldn't look at this this little this person as Johnny. I had to look at him as evidence. Now, there's no way you can get around the the human emotion when you're going and delivering that that message that your your, your loved one is not coming home. There's no way, and you shouldn't. You, you you really should feel that pain because it helps motivate me, knowing that okay, it's my responsibility to bring these folks justice. That's what pushed me through to work the cases. But and and it made it just made things easier for me. That was the only way I knew to do it. Well, did you finally talk to somebody? Did you finally seek oh, help? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, so after um, after maybe that first year of being in homicide, that's when, you know, my wife finally said, you know, look, you're going to have to do something. you got to either get some help. Or I'm out of here. Or I'm out of here. <laughs> I can't do this. I can't put this. Because I had two young kids, man. I had my one, And that was the mistake that I made. This is another thing that we talked about off camera. I stayed in homicide too long, and I went while I was too young in, as, as a family man. Having my kids, I, I can't remember a lot of times with my kids. I don't. I, I, there was a lot of that life that I missed. And what I did was I made my wife a single wife because she, mm-hmm. she, she had to pull the weight. Now, I got a, I got a strong woman, man. She is a, an extremely strong woman because she told all of it. What's her Be- bench press? No, I'm <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's 320 pounds. She, <laughs> she bench press you right off she the bench. She bench press me right now. That was the greatest answer I've ever heard. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> no, man, but you know, she 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 was she had to she had to to do all of it. And plus she was in school too, working full time, two small kids, helping them out with homework, making sure they were getting to their sporting events and doing all the other things that a mom should do, plus doing her own homework and, and things like and that. And trying to take care of a guy who's mentally broken. And right. I was going to say, you know, two small kids and having another kid because yeah. you're really a kid at that point. Absolutely. I mean, how many times do you just drift off in thought about a case that you're working, thinking about what you got to do the next day? And, and you're really not, you're a shell of who you are. You're not, you're not the father. You're not the husband because your mind is somewhere else. Dude, I, I, I swear. It's almost like you read a chapter of the case. And it's gonna. It, that's gonna be a, a a rendition of it, it with our book, Kevin. I Which mean, is, I'm we, talk, we haven't even mentioned. We it. haven't mentioned it. It's I'm man, not, man, you are crazy. Man, so you are crazy. We, we still got we got time left. We could spend a you know whole half hour <laughs> promoting <laughs> your book, but <laughs> but yeah. So uh, I mean, I, I talk a lot about it, man. There have been plenty of times where my wife would be just holding holding conversations, real real conversations with me, and I'm at work, or. I'm going back through my case file and figuring out, what, even though I'm sitting at the dinner table, I'm going back through my case file, figuring out what I need to do the following day. Plenty of times that that has happened. Or like even just watching, you're sitting on the couch with the family watching TV. Right. You're seeing the screen, uh huh, but you're not grasping what's going on there. Mm-mm. No, it's background noise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. And, you know. Having my kids, my kids jumping up and down on me. Uh, uh, my son walking up to me and telling me something, what's going on in school, and and I'm not answering because I'm really he, I'm here and, and body, but in mind I'm still at work. <laughs> You're on the scene, right? Absolutely. Well, that was one of the things that after I finally retired and got through my <clears throat> stuff, that I swore up and down to myself that I was going to be that person who was always there. And I, as busy as my schedule is right now, I make sure that you know I coach them. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I make sure I check on them, make sure that I, I, I'm involved in their life because as a, and even though my kids were very, very young, there's still a lot of stuff that I missed and it mm-hmm. really bothered me. Right. It really, I mean, it, it wasn't so much while I was working, it was after my shooting that I really just detached from, from my family. And, you know, that's time you can never get back. Yeah. So what do you do? You can't fix the past. You can't unring that bell. What can you do? Move forward. So Yeah. So I had to have a lot of long, deep conversations with my kids. Uh, and, and, and thankfully, they will understand a lot of long, deep conversations with my wife. And she, she finally, she, she understood it. She understood it. That's the reason why we're still together now, uh, I think, because she, 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 she gets it. She understand who she understands who I am. She understands what what you went through, what I went through, or what we went through, and she fought through it. You know, so John, there, there are a lot of cops that, and with ex wives that that couldn't do it. You know, I'm not going to mention names, but I know I know an ex cop that uh, his wife had no clue, mm-hmm. you know, and really didn't care, and she used to just say like, "Why don't you just snap out of it?" Yeah, you can't snap out of it. Yeah, you yeah. can't snap out of it. Uh, those are the true, so the people who are trying to understand, they're trying their best to understand, they're the unsung heroes of police work, whether it's male or female. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, I think in this world we live in right now that, I, you know, I'd like to talk to a, a male spouse of a female cop or, you know, oh, whatever, yeah. to find out how they're getting information. Females are usually pr- a little bit better at talking about the stuff. I, I think so. I think my, my my mother and father were a perfect example of that. My mom would always come home and, and talk to my dad, you know, when when um when when things got rough for her at work. I remember a lot of those conversations, you know, but it's different when when it's men. You know, it's, it we we've been we've been Programmed, program, right. programmed to. We've been programmed yeah. to to not bring this home. You can't cry. You can't talk rub, about it. Rub Show some emotion. Dirt on it. Yeah, right. Uh, right. Throw some dirt on it. Get back out there. Go back to work. Put some tape on there and get back in the game. Kid. Right. Right. But I, I think that talking about it and therapy and 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 being able to be transparent has been. It's been key for me. I know. I well, can't. Has that happened in in your new life as a as with reasonable doubt and crime and cookie juice? Your new your podcast with Fatima Silva. How has that helped you work through a lot of that stuff as well? Yeah, I, I think that um, I think that that has been kind of that catharsis that you need in order to get some of this stuff out. That's what this is. Yeah, you you have to be able to talk about it to to people that under that really really truly understand where you won't feel judged, where you won't feel uh, like like you're lesser of a person. You're less of a, exactly like you're less of a person by releasing it. You know, one thing that I love about my partner, my partner Fatima Silva is my that is my ace. That's my ace. We she's always prying and pushing and trying to get you to talk. That first year we were working she's together. She's a defense attorney. What she's a expect? defense attorney, what right? You right. But I think she's more of a psychologist. I think her her because she 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 does ask the unqu- un uncomfortable questions so our first year working together you know how we are we don't want to i still i'm still a cop now let's let's be honest i'm still a cop i still don't want to talk to everybody i mean i'm not gonna release everything but she's one of those ones that'll keep pushing and one day that we i remember a couple of times that we've had conversations where she just kind of poked and pride and poked and pride and i finally started releasing to her and even though after the conversation, she was like, you know, this is her face. And I was like, okay, I didn't, she wasn't expecting that. But, you know, look, I mean, you asked, I'm telling. But I think it's made it more, that made us, us more comfortable with each other. I think I've come to the realization, I think Mike has as well, that nobody is ever going to be able to judge me as harshly as I judged myself. Absolutely. And once you get to that point, it's pretty easy to let stuff go and let mm-hmm. and let loose. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to say you still don't have your moments. I'm sure mm-hmm. you still have your yeah. moments of, of just introspection, uh, dealing with some of the bad things going on. But it's that I'm not afraid anymore. Mm-hmm. And before, I think that's getting down to the crux of it, trying to wrap all this stuff up. It's the fear of seeming like less. And this is a man thing. Mm-hmm. Let's make this very clear. Like this said, is a alpha, alpha male syndrome. Absolutely. 
seeming like less of a man, Mm -hmm. seeming like you're just, you're not as tough as everybody else because you're looking at everybody else around you. And uh, unfortunately, they're they're probably feeling the same thing you're feeling, but they're not talking about it either. And now you got, instead of one unhealthy person, you got a group of unhealthy people. Right, 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 right. And then that, that goes back to, man, that you could trace that back to growing up. Even even before we were cops, because I know my dad, my dad, my dad was not the the father to have if you were a kind of feminine or a, a sensitive type boy. He had three boys that he raised it from the seventies all the way up through the eighties and nineties, and that didn't get in trouble. That were always respectful, and they were almost twice his size. <laughs> you know, so but so, you know he'd kick your but, ass. But no I know matter. he would kick my ass. Yeah. So so you know. And I tried. I got to, I, you know, I wish I could take a lesson from your father because my son's almost taller than me, and I, there's going to be a time when I'm going to. I always got to keep that competitive edge. You, you kick, got to kick his ass down. You got, yeah. Just, just, just for I GP. bully. I bully him now. To just, try it. just for GP. Just, just go in there, <laughs> kick his ass, and I. This is just for the future when you may want to think about whipping my ass. You remember this day. <laughs> my father. My father used to just like walk by me and smack me and say, "You didn't do anything wrong." Just imagine what I'm, what I'm gonna do to you if you do do something wrong. I, uh, right. But you know, look, I, I gotta say this because somebody, yeah, with somebody, we were talking with, I can't even remember all the people. Like Kevin has introduced me to almost everybody in, in in New Jersey today, so I just want y'all to know that I've met a lot of people, and I can't even remember everybody that we talked to. But somebody talked to me, and they were saying how different kids are. The guy that we met at the pizza place today. Oh, uh, Mark. 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 Mark was telling me about how different you know, raising kids. Uh, and he, he was talking about it. I'm like, yeah, that's that's right. They, they're a little bit different. We have to take a different approach than what we were we were privy to as growing up as kids. So, But there were some benefits to us growing up. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And I, and I, I try to work that in right. as well by but being kinder, gentler, a little softer. Right, right, right. So, yeah, that, and that's one thing that I, I, you know, after my son, I think my son was probably about 14 or 15 years old when I got promoted and we got to really start spending a, a lot of quality time together uh, outside of, you know, Saturday morning, get up, go get your haircut with me. And then I'll take you back home to your mom and, and then I'll probably end up going to work or doing whatever. So uh, after my son, you know, my son became a teenager. He's a, he's almost my height now. And we started spending a lot of quality time together and just talking. And, and, and it was, you know, it was a breakthrough for us, when I told him, you know, kind of start laying out why I do what I do. And, and, and why you're feeling what you're feeling at I, certain points. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that was uh, that was huge for him. And now he's a father. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is my granddaughter's, my third granddaughter's uh, seventh day of being here. <laughs> See? Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a new grandfather for the third, for the third time. time. Yeah, it's funny you said that because I did something with my son. I don't even know if I told you this. I did something with my son recently. I took him. We just. I'd never been back to the scene of my shooting. I mm. never went back there. I never looked at it. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I think I drove near it once, trying to go back there, and I couldn't do it. One day, my son's in the car. I'm like, "Hey, let's go for a ride." And before I know it, without looking up, I find myself on the road. And there's a there's a little back because it was in a townhouse complex. There's a little back road there, and I pointed out. I'm like, that's where it happened, right there. And he saw, he saw the the close quarters that that it happened mm-hmm. in. And he knew I was in a shooting. He doesn't know the entire details, but he at at 13 he knows a little bit more each day. And when he looked at, it, he goes, "Wow, that that's that's really small." And I yeah. Go, yeah, it's but that's what I'm. It was, it was bad. So now, now he's got the big picture of right. everything that you've been right. talking about. Right. So what I'm trying to say with that is, is us holding it in, mm-hmm. has it really worked? I, I don't know. It, it, it's not work. It's not the way that you should do it. And I'm glad you brought that up because I did the exact same thing. I know you've read the, read the first portions of, of Man, You're Crazy that I wrote and I submitted to Kevin and I always bouncing ideas off of each other. I wanted him to read the first portion of the book. I talk about an incident where I had, um, where a guy that I, and I, I'm, I'm trying to put this in the, as nice a way as possible. Had I 
been in a, a, a the guy that I am today, he would not be alive. You know, and I had a situation. Okay, so I'm, I'm riding down the street, and this is this will be in the book. I'm riding down the street, and I see this guy. He's pointing the SKS rifle at, at this group of people that are standing on the sidewalk. I recognize these folks because they are. This is this is my beat. I know everybody on my beat. I see him. I see my 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 neighbors, the guys that are living that the, the people that live in my neighborhood, and he's pointing a, a SKS rifle with him. I'm a rookie cop. Now I don't know if y'all did this when y'all first came through the academy, but when we can't first come out, they give you a 38 revolver. No, we not no no we, we really? yeah no, I, had, I had a Glock. So no. <laughs> no, we couldn't do that for your first year. You had to carry a 38 oh. revolver. Oh, it wasn't the time. It was just that's what you had to carry. That's what you had to carry. Wow. Yeah, you had to go through a transition school before you could be a, a, a carry an automatic weapon, but they issued you a 38 revolver. So I jump out. I see this guy with this SKS rifle. He's got a long 30-round clip or whatever, and then it's hanging out. It's a banana clip, so I know it was 30 rounds. Maybe, you know, he's pointing at them. And the first thing I do is what? You get out of the car. You point your weapon at him. This dude takes off running. Now, I'm just, I'm a rookie. So I'm thinking, I can't shoot him in the back. I can't shoot him. I, I just, just chase him down, you know. So I'm running behind him. He turns around points his weapon at me so what's the first thing that you think to do grab some cover and then you fire because i know i'm not going up against the sk i'm not going to win this battle but i i can't not do anything i can't just sit in the car and call for backup chase him and start chasing him again that happened twice the next time he did it now he's standing back in front of the people that were that that he was pointing a weapon at so i couldn't shoot at him then at any rate i chase him down uh i i know I, I let him go and I knew he wasn't gonna run that far because, like, I'm 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 21 years old. He's in his 40s. He just got out of prison not too long ago. He's way overweight. I ended up catching him and recovering the weapon and uh, taking him into custody. When I get back to the car, putting him in the car, I'm now backups arriving, and they go back and recover the weapon. They find out that the SKS rifle had a stovepipe. The, the, yeah, so it, it couldn't recycle. It couldn't right recycle, right? So P, P, let's explain what a stovepipe is. When when the when the bullet recycles, the shell re- recycles out of out of the the receiver, it'll stand upright and jam the weapon, kind of yeah. like this, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so so the weapon was jammed. Now, it wasn't until after I got this joker into custody that I realized how traumatized I was. I mean, because I'm running off a of straight adre- adrenaline. And I'm and I'm 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 able to think a little bit, but I didn't realize it. And then you know, he tried it, to kill you. He he tried to kill me, mm-hmm. and I would have been, and he would have successfully done it Sto- had it not been because you stove know stovepipe saved your life. Stovepipe saved my life. I, I always said it is God. God has always had His arms around me. I mean, He's had so many angels around me because there are so many. There have been so many times where. I probably shouldn't have made it. You know, it, it's amazing too. And unless you're in law enforcement, they don't know the adrenaline kicks in, mm-hmm. right? And now your heart's beating. Right. You're in a foot pursuit. Mm-hmm. So now your adrenaline is up. You're breathing heavy, and it's like, well, why didn't you shoot him then? I, and, shoot, and, shoot him in the leg. And yeah. that is the yeah. question. Why didn't you shoot the gun out of his hand? That that is the question. That really just it's like raking fingernails across a chalkboard for me hmm. for years it 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 hurt me to say it because look i have always questioned that incident help is is what made me question whether or not i should be in law enforcement hmm. i almost quit because you know why didn't you shoot him why why didn't you do this why didn't you do that those are the questions that ring in your mind all the while you're thinking about, you almost died. It would have been a closed casket funeral had one or two of those bullets connected. So that's one of the things that, that and it and it it followed me throughout my, most of my career. I'm sure it still follows you today. Today, it, 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 pisses, me, it pisses me off because that was the one question that everybody, the same fuckers that did not come out there and help me were asking me this question. Why didn't you shoot him? I got a fucking thirty eight. 
the, the guys that were sitting in the office in headquarters while right. you were out while on the I street was out there, said, oh, why, why didn't, didn't you, you shoot, shoot him? him? Why didn't you do this? Why don't you get off your ass and fucking back me up? Right. So, so, yeah. So, Chris, you know, we're coming to the end of this thing, and I want to find out where can our audience find you? So I am on all social media, uh, Facebook at Detective Chris Anderson, Instagram at Detective Christopher Anderson, and I am on Twitter at the, it's D-E-T-C Anderson. I don't do Twitter that much. I'm, it's We're, just, we got Twitter as well. I, it, it, it rarely gets filled. <laughs> yeah. So, but Instagram, I am all over Instagram. I'm all over Facebook. Uh, and, and plus you can find us, um, our Instagram, we have an Instagram account for crime and cookie juice podcast where, you know, Fatima Silva and I, we talk, we, we talk a little bit about bourbon because, you know, look, that is, I, I still have a taste for bourbon. I don't drink nearly as much as I used to, but for the crime and cookie juice podcast, I will drink. But you don't care. As, as we're coming to the end of this, I got a question for you and Chris. Tell us about your book. <laughs> well, the book is called Man, You Are Crazy. So mm -hmm. if you go to manyourcrazy.com, it's also on social media, Man, You Are Crazy book on Instagram, Man, You Are Crazy on TikTok. Man, You Are, yeah, it's Man, You Are Crazy on TikTok. And we have some exciting things. We're going to, we're, we're teetering. Hopefully next Friday we'll have a, a little better announcement for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, getting somebody involved in the project who is, who is quite, quite large. Um, His name doesn't rhyme with Mike Felice, does it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, you, you're right. It's Schmike Malace. <laughs> it's Fike Malace. <laughs> so this book is, this book is a labor of love. You know, I, I, when we first connected on this thing, I had had a good portion of this stuff written. So I don't think I wrote it so fast. Nah, I don't think I, so I had a good portion of it written. I had to rework it because it was written like a police report. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did this and I did this and I did this. And then, then this happened. So I had to rework it a little bit. But it's really a labor of love and it's really a cathartic thing to get all this stuff out. Because as I'm writing this book, even doing this show where I let a lot of stuff out, mm -hmm. new stuff started coming out. Yeah. New stuff just started raising up like I, you know I, I spent time in a, in a mental institution because I took a bunch of Klonopin and just washed it down with a bunch of alcohol and my wife called the police on me and that's something I didn't for, I, I just didn't remember right um, but I don't know for me it's cathartic I can't speak for you Chris no it is um, I think the writing of it has caused me to tap into some areas where I thought I had done away with I thought I had pushed you know had, had been pushed away so deep but they they're still there man you, you, you see I, I i felt my myself get a little bit heated when i do when you, you say why did you shoot him because it's still there man it, it, so I, I talk about that incident and i talk about several other incidents because after i put that joke in jail he still came back into my life the story of the prairie fire will be in there just so you know. Go for it. Just so you know. Episode nine, too. <laughs> Chris, we're- But what, what, what I say all the time is everything you do goes into the hard drive of your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, hard drive on a computer, everything stays in there. Mm -hmm. It's when you tap into that hard drive. When yeah. something initiates that hard drive to keep moving, other thoughts are going to come up. Other scenarios are going to come up. And, you know- you got to learn to suppress those those yeah. feelings when it comes down to it. All you can do is just keep moving forward. One of my favorite quotes is from Gladiator. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of this, very beginning of the movie, in the, before the battle scene, he says, "What what we do in life echoes in eternity." That's right. Because what you what you did in, as a homicide detective, what you're doing now, it is always going to echo in eternity. Mm -hmm. So, as we're coming to the end of this thing here, you spent this storied career as a detective. You've seen all these different things. You've seen the worst and the worst. In human in humanity, what do you think your suffering has taught you? Man, that's a deep question. My suffering has taught me how to be a much better husband, a much better father, and a much better man. A much better person. Yeah. Along the lines, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly glad I know you, Chris. And I'm glad I know you too, KD. I, I really am glad. Mike, well, you know, not so much. <laughs> I'm just in here. Mike Mike is always my brother. Yeah, right. He will forever be my brother to the day I die. And yeah. you know, from the day from day one that we connected, 
I love him dearly. If yeah. I would have known Chris was, you know, never had Taylor Ham before, I would have brought some up. <laughs> <I wish laughs> How about have. Spam? Did you ever have Spam before? Absolutely. There you go. Is that what it is? Is that no. Taylor Ham? No, it, no, that's no. Another, that's that's another. Another. <laughs> spam, spam is sort of an ins- inside joke. So I mean, try- it, we, we have a right. bunch of inside jokes. Like, uh, <laughs> who's a better singer, Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley? You know, oh, just, just stop. Just, just please. answer. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm from the south. Okay, so look, I've never listened to any of those dudes for real, so <laughs> I can't make that uh, a determination. <laughs> Neither one of those guys are in my playlist. We okay, sit, so, we sit on the opposite <laughs> ends of the field. Yeah. So, so, Andrew, right now it's two one one. It's uh, uh, Frank Sinatra two, Elvis Presley one, and Chris says he's he's tied. That's all right. I'll spend some more time with Chris, and we'll. we'll <laughs> yeah. By the time you go back to Alabama, you're gonna love Elvis. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? Southern boy doesn't like another Southern boy. Come on, Memphis, dude. Tennessee. Come I don't on. know if we have a lot to, uh, in common. <laughs> well, that's gonna do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast, the Suffering of, detect- of a Detective with Detective Chris Anderson. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned today. Don't carry a load of bricks on your back. But holish is my word of the day. Butthole. <laughs> you can't unring the bell, but you can move forward. Mm-hmm. There is always evidence, but most importantly, thank God for stovepipes. There you go. That's right. That's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast. Don't forget, you can always listen before you watch. And if you're looking to go out for dinner tonight, go to Grand Saloon, 940 Van Houten Avenue in Clifton. Go see Nick. He'll take care of you. Follow us on all social media platforms. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And, of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. We're going to see you on the next episode. 